God instructs those who are wise. Now listen carefully because it seems like other people are, they're going to win. But God moves in when you least expect it. Very, very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television taking you through the Bible today, Psalm 90 to 94. As we study this, Corey helps us to understand what's going on. Corey? Today we're going to be looking at the tomb of a very famous man mentioned in the Bible. Tombs are interesting things to consider when you're looking at all of the past. Very, very good. What did you do today? Today we're going to talk about Psalm 94. Very good. Excellent. Psalm 94 is a good one. Mm -hmm. And Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing. Ryan? Today I'm looking at the life of a man the Bible refers to as a mighty hunter before the Lord. Oh, Nimrod. That's interesting. Very good. We'll look forward to that. And also remember to get your Bible guide out with your Bible because the Bible is the most important book that you'll ever read. Let's study. Today, you and I are going to be looking at an accidental but a very intriguing find in modern day Jerusalem. Uh, we are going to be taking a look at the family tomb of Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest during the, the lifetime of Jesus Christ. He's mentioned a few times in the New Testament Gospels. So come with me and take a look at what archaeologists have discovered. In 1990, an ancient tomb was accidentally discovered. Carved directly into Jerusalem's bedrock, it contained six intact ossuaries, or bone boxes, and six overturned and broken ossuaries, evidence of an ancient grave robbery that for whatever reason was never completed. This burial cave was originally accessed through a small entranceway. Once inside, a pit was dug into the floor to allow mourners to stand upright. The tomb features four loculi, long recesses first used to place a body for decomposition and later to house ossuaries where the bones of the deceased were collected and stored. Many of the ossuaries of this tomb were decorated with carved patterns. Five of the ossuaries bear name inscriptions, and two of these inscribed ossuaries caught the particular attention of archaeologists. Both were found still tucked away in one of the loculi, and both contain the Aramaic equivalent to the famous name Caiaphas. One of these ossuaries is decorated intricately on its front and lid and bears two longer inscriptions. Both read, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. In this ossuary, the remains of two infants, a two to five year old child, a teenage boy, an adult woman, and a man around 60 years old were found. This elderly man has become the topic of much discussion. In the New Testament, the high priest presiding over the interrogation of Jesus is referred to as Caiaphas. The writings of first century historian Josephus give a longer name for him. Joseph Caiaphas and Joseph, who is called Caiaphas. It is possible to understand the inscription on this ossuary as meaning Joseph of the family of Caiaphas. There is a known lack of diversity in personal names during the Second Temple time period, so it's not surprising that many went by family names or nicknames. The inscriptions, an intricately designed box worthy of a one-time high priest, have led many scholars to the belief that this box houses the family and remains of New Testament Caiaphas. So there we have it. You know, there are there were a few different kinds of tombs that were in use at the time period of Caiaphas. So what we see in Caiaphas's tomb, we see, you know, a very typical uh, second temple period tomb where you have the loculi, so those body, um, the the holes cut in the walls to, to for a body um, to decompose within. Uh, and then um, ossuaries being uh, stored in the same tomb, uh, but also common in the second temple period, so around the first century, would be uh, two different gra uh, graves and tombs. So you would have a grave that you would put the body in for decomposition, then the bones would be collected out of that grave, popped into an ossuary, and uh, placed in a different family tomb. So, there, so that was a practice that was going on as well. Now, uh, there were also a lot of people who were reusing tombs that came from the first temple period, so the time period of the kings of Israel and 
Judah. So before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, that's when these uh, tombs were cut out of rock. And generally speaking, they would have benches for the bodies to decompose on. And then something called bone repositories underneath the benches. So a, a, a hollowed out area underneath the bench where you could store the person's bones once the body had decomposed and you could reuse that bench. Well, um, some people were reusing these types of tombs during the time period of Jesus and just using bone boxes um, or the bone repository. God instructs the wise. Those who ignore God's ways are foolish. Well, in today's world, it seems a controversial statement, but it is what the Bible tells us. And if we believe the Bible, we must listen to the Lord and really hear him. Listening to and hearing are different today. We do well to listen to and do better when we actually hear the Lord. Some people listen and they consider. Others listen, hear, consider, and then act upon what God says. You know, we must listen, hear, and do what God says. Psalms 94.12 speaks to the reader and it says, Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord. When we listen to hear the works of God through his word, we can learn his instructions and they are given so that we can live our life well. We do not choose our lifestyle from selections presented in today's pop culture. God explains life so that we can live trouble free. Psalm 94, verses 1 through 13. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet, they say, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. Understand you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are futile. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. Psalm 94, verses 1 through 13. I, I keep telling you the same thing, and you know it's true, that the Psalms are real. I mean, there is no music more real than this. It is in the Word of God. It is called the Word of God. And this is Psalm 94. Listen carefully. It says, O Lord God of vengeance. God of vengeance? Interesting. Now, we'll talk about this as we go further. It says, God of vengeance. O God of vengeance, shine forth. What are you talking about? My goodness. Rise up. O oh, judge of the earth, you got to be kidding me. These are pieces of music that God has written for us to hear and to read. And we need to understand them today. Get your Bible guide out in your Bible because this is a very important day. 
And I pray that God will help you. If you don't have your Bible guide, you can use the addresses on the bottom or go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. As we look at this, as we understand this, as we get it, we need to ask the Lord to speak to us because we're talking about a time when the word of God says this, God instructs the wise. God instructs the wise. Now, what does that mean? It means that there are times when we are not wise and there are times when sin affects us, but there are other times when we're at that moment and God instructs us in those times. We need to hear that. We read Psalm 90 to 94. We're looking at Psalm 94 verses one to 13. Now, Father, today I pray you would help us to understand this. We need to know, we need to hear what you're saying because this is important from your word. And your word is going into our heart right now. We're taking it into our heart. We're broadcasting it over the air. So we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you would help us today to hear what you're saying. Amen. Listen carefully to the book, book of Psalms. This is very interesting. 94 verse 1 says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. That's amazing. O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up. O oh, judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? Now, this is amazing because this is a psalm. This is a piece of music. Some people do not live according to the Bible. They don't. It looks like they will triumph. It does. But Jesus Christ knows the truth. Listen carefully. It's very important that the psalmist used God the vengeance because this vengeance is not like our vengeance. Remember that the emotions of God are holy. Remember that the truth about God is he is righteous. So his emotions are perfect. Ours are not. He can be angry and not sin. He can do all of those things. We cannot. We can only do that with the Holy Spirit in us. It's very important for us to learn and to understand that. So when we say God of vengeance, we're talking about the perfect God, God who is perfect in the way that he does things. Now listen carefully, because God will speak. God will do things that you think should be done right now. Do this right now, Lord. Well, hold on a minute. God isn't doing it for a reason. There will come a time. Nobody's getting away with anything, anything. God will do it. We need to wait for the Lord to speak. We need to wait for the Lord. Then when the God of vengeance does, you better watch out if you've done some wrong to people. I would suggest that you invite Jesus into your heart and, and repent of the wrong that you have done and ask the Lord to help you because he will confront you on those issues. Very important. Psalm 94 verse four says, they uttered speech. They speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They boast in themselves. They're all proud of themselves, taking selfies everywhere. <laughs> they break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and the murder. They murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord does not see. Oh, he doesn't see. No, nor does God of Jacob understand. No, he doesn't. Now, let me tell you something. People who ignore God believe he doesn't see them. But God sees everything we do in this life. Every single action, every single reaction. God sees it, beloved. We need to understand that. And we need to realize it because if we don't, we're not going to live right. We need to understand that there is a higher authority, a higher moral value, a higher place where God speaks from. And I want to tell you something. This is not judgmental because this is God on us, God on me. It's me. I'm not projecting to anybody else. I'm saying me. I've got to watch it. And so do you, because the Lord Jesus Christ speaks from that angle. You know, this is very important and you need to hear what I'm saying here because as we go into verse eight, God begins to explain. He says, understand you senseless among the people. Understand you senseless among the people, you fools. When will you be wise? He who planted the ear shall not, shall he not hear? He made your ears. 
He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts, the thoughts of man, that they are futile. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him rest, give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. That is unbelievable. We must listen to hear the word of God. He will judge us according to what he has told us. God has spoken to us what right and wrong is. God has told us what his law is. God has, has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you invite me into your heart, I will send my spirit. And my spirit will begin to teach you through sanctification. And that's something else. I'll tell you, we'll be enemies of sin. And it's very important that we do that. God says, if you don't, there's going to come a time when you will be judged by the creator. I do not want to be one of those people. I want to be one of the people who say, Jesus Christ took my case, Lord. Talk to him. Because God is a perfect judge. We need to understand that Jesus Christ frees us from all of that when we take him as Lord of our life. Take Jesus today, beloved. Very important. Entering the rest of God, what does that mean? Do we grow tired? Are we ready to rest? But I don't think that's what the Bible means here. We'll explore this next time on Quick Study Television. Make sure you join us, right? Well, today I'm going really far back in history to uncover a somewhat mysterious individual who's become the stuff of myth and legend. Though many stories of him abound, the Bible gives us his true account. He has been called by many names. Some see him as the legendary hero Gilgamesh, while others identify him with ancient kings such as Tukulti Ninurta of Assyria, Amenhotep III of Egypt, or even Sargon of Akkad. Still others equate him with Babylonian or Assyrian deities. Though this real historical figure has become deeply shrouded in myth and legend, his true account is found in the Bible. The Bible calls him Nimrod. Genesis 10 reveals that he was the son of Cush, who was the grandson of Noah. Genesis 10, 8 to 12 records that Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. Although Nimrod is the only individual in this Table of Nations document with any significant description, still it is limited. Nevertheless, a great deal of tradition has been built up around him. For example, according to Jewish lore, Nimrod was the leader of the rebellion at Babel and the chief builder of the tower. Though this idea has been adopted by many, including Josephus, it is interesting to note that the Bible never actually says that Nimrod was the force behind Babel. This has merely been inferred from Genesis 10.10, 10, which states that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. Since Babel was the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom, it seems logical to conclude that he was the leader of the rebellion there. His name and title are also suggestive. Nimrod means, let us revolt, and his title, Mighty Hunter Before the Lord, or more literally, Mighty Hunter in the Face of the Lord, implies opposition to God. 
However, a major problem with identifying Nimrod as leader of the rebellion is that in the actual Babel account recorded in Genesis 11, there is no hint of Nimrod. Nimrod is not mentioned, and the Bible clearly reveals that the people were rebelling in unison against God's command to fill the earth. Also, Genesis 10.10 does not say that the first center of his kingdom was Babel, but four places, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. And verse 11 says that Nimrod even went to Assyria to build four other cities. So how could Nimrod be leading a rebellion in the name of unity when he himself was scattering abroad? At the same time, Babel was his kingdom, so how could he not be the leader of the rebellion? With a proper understanding of the timing of events, all becomes clear. Nimrod did take over Babel, and he was in all likelihood an evil dictator. However, the takeover occurred after God scattered the peoples. Indeed, after God confused the languages, Nimrod took over Babel, as well as Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and other places. So while many have pinned Nimrod as the leader behind the initial rebellion at Babel, the Bible does not identify him as such. What the Bible does say is that the people were rebelling in unison. And actually, there's no mention of Nimrod in that Babel passage. It's my belief then that Nimrod took over Babel and the other places after the scattering had taken place. But not all is lost because the Bible does seem to imply that Nimrod was an ungodly individual. For example, the Bible gives him the title, a mighty hunter before the Lord, or more literally, mighty hunter in the face of the Lord. So Nimrod was not somebody that we would want to model our lives after, that's for sure. It's true, Ryan, and you know, there's a lot of people that have said things about Nimrod that are not true. And there's a lot of people who have not checked the Bible that said the Bible says things. But uh, it, it is interesting to explore it and to see what the Bible does say about him so we can mm -hmm. understand what he is actually uh, accredited with. You know, a yeah. mighty hunter before the Lord. I've heard this as a good thing and I've heard this as a bad thing. I tend to believe it's a bad thing, but mm -hmm. uh, because hunting was never ever a part of God's plan for Adam and all of that. And also, uh, when, you, when you look at it, you begin to understand, oh, okay, I, I get that. Mm -hmm. And the thing with Babel too, we don't know uh, exactly who was the total, the guy behind the Tower of Babel, but we make the assumption that it's Nimrod. So it's important that we remember what the Bible says. Yeah, that's key. We, we really do have to put the Bible in authority over everything else. You know? We do. So if it doesn't agree with the Bible, then personally, I don't believe that, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not scripture. Right, exactly. Yeah, Very we have to hold interesting. it up higher. You know, I was, I was in Jerusalem and back in 91, and uh, I was standing on this park just outside of Jerusalem and we were taping television there and we had to stop. I mean, the men came and they said, you gotta move, you gotta move. And mm -hmm. it was the police and I said, why, why do we have to move? Jim said to me, uh, Jim Canalon said to me, oh, they, you know, they're doing something, they found something. It wasn't until five weeks later when I got on the airplane to leave Israel and come back home that I read in the newspaper they found Caiaphas's tomb. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. You gotta be kidding me. We were standing on Caiaphas' tomb and didn't even know it? That's the thing, there's so much still undiscovered. I mean, for all the discoveries that have been made, and, and there have been thousands of discoveries made, there are still more. So it's, it's always well, very exciting. <laughs> I mean, there's years and years of stuff. Yeah, thousands of years. Jerusalem, mm -hmm. yeah. thousands of years. Thousands of years of occupation, so it's still occupied, so people and are still living there. You know, another city is Jericho. There's a lot of stuff in Jericho. Anywhere you dig in Israel, pretty much, you're going to come up with something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. And don't you believe that God allows these things to be revealed in his timing? Of course he yeah, does. You know, For his purposes. Like you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. 1947. And that's actually the year they were forming Israel. Mm -hmm. But that's one year before the actual, you know, the United Nations did it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait a I minute. Know. That's amazing. There's just sometimes where a, a discovery will come up and, and, and it'll be like, what what a needle in a haystack that is. What are the chances that we would find this one thing that directly relates to uh, someone that's written about in the Bible and is very important or, or very bizarre in the Bible. And then you find 
uh, evidence of it or a reference to it in history. And it's one of those things where it's very difficult not to attribute providence exactly. to. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. In <laughs> fact, well, anyway, that's a, another story for another day. But that's very interesting. Very good, Ryan. Mm -hmm. And uh, good on the tombs. Anyway, what did you do? Well, I talked about, or I'm going to be talking about Psalm 94. I know you taught on it today. Uh, it's, it's, it's a psalm about God, the refuge of the righteous. Now, that word righteous doesn't mean perfection. It means right before God. And that's what Jesus Christ brings to our life when we ask him to be the Lord of our life, when we ask him to forgive us of our sins. He comes in and he begins to change us from the inside out. We become sanctified. It's that word that means we, we begin to change because our hearts and our minds begin to change because we understand what God has done for us and the gift that he's given us through Jesus Christ. So God is the refuge for us who call him Lord, who depend upon him and understand that we have our very life breath from him. And we get to verse 19 and it really struck me because a lot of times we feel as though as followers of Jesus Christ that we should you know what? I'm just going to be honest that sometimes we have to appear to people around us like we're, there's nothing wrong, mm. that we don't have any troubles, that everything is good. Acting. When somebody mm. says, well, hi, how are you today? And our answer is always, oh, fine, thank you, or something like that. Now, I'm not talking about um, an attitude of always being down like mm -hmm. Eeyore, you know, poor Eeyore <laughs> in, in Winnie the Pooh. He was always forlorn. That's not what I'm talking about. But there are times when life is difficult and we need that surrounding of the family of God to be around us. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like you're all alone in this or that you're going through a really tough time right now. I want to encourage you that you are not alone, that God is with you, even though you may not feel that. And the psalmist at this point in verse 19, listen to what it says in the multitude of my anxieties within me. They're anxieties. admitting, they're admitting in the multitude of my anxieties within me. But listen now, your, you comfort, your comforts delight my soul. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. This psalmist understood that when anxieties come, the comfort comes from God alone. And that's what delights our soul. That's why we put the word of God in our hearts every day, because it brings us those comforts. Philippians verse four, six says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He will hear you today. He will in thanksgiving. Amazing. And God will bring delight and comfort to your soul. He is our refuge today and all the tomorrows that we have. Mm -hmm.